Now we're going to discuss membrane behavior. An initial piece of information to keep in mind when discussing membrane behavior is that sodium and potassium are your two main ions that determine the electrical difference across membrane. And that electrical difference is known as your membrane potential. So always keep it in mind that when you're looking at a cell, potassium is rich inside the cell while sodium is low within the cell. And outside the cell, your sodium is high and your potassium is low. Now, the fact that sodium is high on the outside and low on the inside will create that concentration gradient that we need for sodium to naturally want to move into the cell. At the same time, the high potassium inside will naturally force potassium out of the cell. Okay, now in a steady state, that's what we're looking at. Okay. If we make a cell more negative, let's say if we force potassium out of the cell, um, what that does is it makes it more negative and the cell is more uh, less likely to depolarize. So if you make a cell more negative, we decrease depolarization. Where if we make a cell more positive, we increase the chances of depolarization. And that's what we're going to discuss in the next few uh, minutes. So when we're looking at the um, action potential, which is going to essentially look like this, what we need to realize is that sodium channels play a major role in the initial um, upward slope and significant and rapid rise in depolarization. That has to do with sodium channels. And there's specific anatomy to sodium channels that we need to kind of be aware of. So if we're looking at sodium channels, we have to realize we're on a, one side is the cytoplasm. And then we have the plasma right here. We have an H gate. And we have an M gate. Okay. When the membrane wants to depolarize, okay, the M gate opens up just slightly, and it allows sodium to move in. So the H remains like so, and the M will open up slightly. At that time, sodium starts to move in. So the M gate is going to open up first. Okay, so by concentration gradient alone, some potassium is going to leak through. Okay. Once, th once the threshold potential is reached, all the sodium channels are opened up. So when we're looking at our action potential graph, we get to a point where we reach that, that potential that is going to force, it's the all or nothing principle, so it's going to force the action potential to go through. At that point, what these two gates look like are this. The H gate is wide open and the M gate is wide open and that allows sodium to freely flow into the cell. Okay, So that's once a threshold potential has been reached. And at this point, we would call this, or these are fast sodium channels. We would call the first ones are slow. sodium channels. Okay, so that's just a look at the, the, the gates of the sodium channels. Okay. Now when it comes to electrolyte movement, we always want to look at concentration gradient first. Concentration gradient is going to be your number one factor for determining movement of an electrolyte. So number one is concentration gradient. But we do have electrical gradients, and that's where something called the Nernst number comes in. All electrolytes have a certain number that's assigned to them. Okay, so sodium, chloride, bicarb, magnesium, calcium, they all want to move inward, while we know potassium wants to move outward. So if we draw a cell here,
we know that potassium is on the inside. We know that we know that sodium is an extracellular ion. We know that calcium is an extracellular ion. We know that magnesium is an extracellular ion. We also know that chloride is an extracellular ion. Okay. Now, when it comes to this electrical gradient, the Nernst number is a number that's assigned to each one of these. And ultimately, what that's going to do is it's going to determine the charge at which this ion will be happy with the membrane being. So what we'll do is we'll illustrate this, and that'll make more sense. It'll also help us understand a few important clinical aspects of medicine. Now, resting membrane potential, as we know, is negative 90 millivolts. The Nernst number of chloride is negative 90. So we know that the Nernst number associated with chloride is the same as membrane potential. That means chloride is satisfied already before we do anything. So that means chloride is going to neither move in nor move out of a cell. And that's why we don't even talk about chloride for the most part when it comes to membrane behavior. Now, sodium has a Nernst number of positive 65. Calcium and magnesium are both positive 120. Positive 120, positive 120. Potassium is negative 96. So based on these numbers, we know sodium, calcium, and magnesium are all positive. They're positive, and this membrane is at negative 90. That means sodium wants to drive into the cell with a goal of reaching a membrane of positive 65. Now, will that ever happen? We'll figure that out in a minute. Calcium and magnesium each want to make that membrane a plus 120 millivolt membrane. Will that ever happen? We don't know. We'll figure that out. What about potassium? If we look at potassium, we see that its Nernst number is minus 196, which means in order to reach that, this membrane only has to move 6 millivolts. This is probably the ion that is most likely to achieve its, its potential, its, its electrical gradient. Okay? But what we'll do is we'll do some examples of these and we'll figure out exactly what this all means. And the way we can do that is by discussing driving force. Okay, the driving force will tell you how fast you can expect an ion to enter the cells as well as who will compete to get in above the others. Okay, now how we determine driving force is simple. We take the uh, electrical gradient of the ion, which we'll call E ion, and we will subtract the electrical gradient of the membrane. We'll call it EMEMB. Okay, so once we figure out each ion's driving force, we can easily determine who will move into a cell into a cell faster than someone else, okay? So let's take um, magnesium and sodium as examples. So if we put sodium here and we put magnesium here, we know the E ion of sodium is plus 65, and we know the E of the membrane is minus 90. Well, remember, a minus minus 90 would mean that that's going to be become a plus. So what we'll do is we'll just make that a plus. So 90 plus 65, that equals 155. So the driving force of sodium 
which means essentially the speed at which it wants to move into that cell is plus 155. Now, if we look at magnesium, it has a electrical gradient or an E ion of 120 and minus minus 90 means it's going to be plus 90 and that means it's going to have a driving force equal to positive 210. So if we have an ion of sodium here and we have an ion of magnesium here and we know that magnesium has a driving force of 210 and sodium has a driving force and we want to know who is going to get into that cell faster. All we have to do is take a look which one is, has a faster driving force. That's magnesium. Magnesium has a stronger driving force to get into that cell. So what this ultimately means is that magnesium will fight harder and move into a cell much faster than sodium. Okay, calcium has the same Nernst number as magnesium. Remember, calcium is also a 210, a positive 210. Okay, now what this means is we can apply this concept to clinical medicine because anytime we have a patient who is hyper depolarizing, such as during a seizure, such as a patient who is eclamptic, okay, um, pregnant and experiencing seizures in addition to significant blood pressure and proteinuria, okay, we can give IV magnesium. We give IV magnesium because what that does is it gets to the cell faster than sodium, right? And what it will do is it will block sodium channels and it'll stop the hyperdepolarizations and thus it'll stop the seizure. And that's the ultimate takeaway message from understanding these driving forces is because we understand now why we give magnesium to a pregnant patient who is seizing. Okay, because it'll shut down those sodium channels because it gets into the cell faster based on its driving force. And one last thing to take away from all of this is the concept of permeability. We essentially have three things to deal with. We have small ions, we have medium-sized, and we have large ions. Your small ions are things like sodium, magnesium, calcium, chloride. Medium-sized ions would be those that are combinations such as sodium chloride. Okay. Large ions would be things like bicarb, glucose, and other big molecules. The smaller something is, the easier time it has getting through. The larger something is, the more apt it is to need a certain protein or a transporter in order to get across into a cell.